Good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here in Poland again for the third time. It's always a pleasure to come here to Copernicus and talk to you. And I've heard we have many young makers here in the audience. And so it's great to have you here too. You are the reason we do all this work in the end. So um, today I want to talk about this topic of equity and diversity in maker education, which I believe is our challenge for the next 10 years. And before I, I begin, I want to first acknowledge my students and collaborators uh, from Stanford and other places. One of them um, is Polish, uh, Alicia, who is here in the audience. She's been working with my team for seven years. And also other professors that I collaborate with and my, uh, the institutions that fund the work that we do. Um, if you, need, if you want more information about the, the FabLearn program that uh, was mentioned just a few seconds ago, you can go to the website. We have partnerships and uh, sites in many, many different places, and including here in Poland. And if you search for this uh, hashtag, you find lots of educational materials, units. Uh, we have a, a book that we publish every year with best practices and everything. So you can also use this to post on uh, Twitter if you find something worthwhile posting. I want to step, step back a little bit about uh, 100 years ago and remind ourselves a little bit of how we used to look at education. So this is a disturbing quote, um, but let's you know, make an effort to look at it. It's from a Stanford professor from 1922. And what uh, Louis Sturman said is that, you know, their donors, so he was talking about Indians, Mexican, Negroes, seems to be racial. The fact that one meets this type often among Indians, Mexican, Negroes, suggested the question of racial differences and mental differences will have to be taken up anew. The children should be segregated in special classes. They cannot master abstractions, but they can be made efficient workers. So they're talking He's talking about Indians, Mexican, Negroes. They cannot understand abstractions, but they can be good workers. And this is not a Stanford professor, but another intellectual from you know, just over a little bit more than 100 years ago. They say, most, in the most intelligent races, there are a large number of women whose brains are closer to the size of gorillas. A desire to give them the same education is a dangerous illusion. So this is uh, disturbing and, of course, horrifying. Uh, to read. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, it's not over yet, and that's something we have to fight uh, to, against uh, tirelessly. But uh, education just about 100 years ago was a lot about educating a small elite of people that were the white males that had uh, supposedly superior intelligence and superior uh, capacities. And everyone else was sort of a second-class uh, citizen for education. And it was totally OK to think about education in this way. But, and this was the first formula that we had to do education uh, in large scale, which was uh, you know, the first formula, let's racially and segregate people by gender, by race, by all kinds of other things. So we can give good education to a small part of our population, and the rest will get whatever you know, we can do, and they can be workers, they can stay in the home, and all of that. And this has been, or had been, um, how we did education until the 1930s, 40s. But you know, fortunately, we realized that, oh, this is not OK. It's not okay to segregate people because they are you know, of their gender, race, and, and all of that. And then there was this amazing and incredible idea that uh, came to the world of education, the idea of equity. So the idea that everybody should get the same opportunities in schools, regardless if you're black or white or uh, a woman or a man or whatever, uh, that everybody is the same. We're all the same. We have all the same capabilities. We might be born in a, a family with more money or opportunities or less, 
but that should not limit how far we can get. And education should be an equalizer. Education should have the same quality and, and put everybody on the same ground. And, and that is, I think, you know, probably at, at par with universal health care, the hardest challenge that we humans set for ourselves. So if you go back to ancient Greece, uh, the idea of you know, universal health care, it was crazy. Like if you get sick, you have no money, you, you die. I mean, we, there's nothing we can do. But at some point we said, no, I mean, no one should die because of lack of money. Society will organize itself to provide free health care to everyone. So you will never die because you don't have money. And in just 50 years ago, we had the same idea for education. We said, okay, no one should be with no education because you don't have the resources or money or whatever. We should give education to everybody. But while this is an amazing idea, it's very hard to do. It's very expensive. It's often hard to convince society that we all have to pay for it. We all have to work and pay taxes because this is a beautiful and valuable principle. So we have been trying to do this for many decades. And the second formula, the formula that's uh, inspired a little bit in this idea of equity, is the idea of uniformity. So the idea will achieve educational equity by giving everybody the same content at the same time on the same day. And that's going to give people you know, the same opportunities, the same, uh, uh, put everybody on the same playing ground. And so the idea is like, if we could just teach the same stuff to everybody, we'll be fine with educational equity. And every time we talk about giving everybody the same, standardizing and all of that, uh, you know, technologists come to the rescue because technologists are very good at producing stuff that's always the same, mass producing cars, uh, fridges, TVs, and, and all of that. And here I'm going to show a picture that you just saw a few moments ago, which was how a French artist from 1899 imagined uh, how this would happen. You just saw this picture in the beginning which was, you know, we'll grind the books and there'll be some magic technology that will put that inside the, the heads of kids. And, you know, even though this sounds like funny, this was a very real uh, dream, a very real um, idea. And people like Thomas Edison had this idea in the early uh, 20th century that current textbooks function at only 2% efficiency. Education of the future will be through the medium of motion picture, which is 100% efficiency. So, you know, sort of the same idea, right? That we'll somehow find this technology that will replace teachers and that will make education efficient so that we can give high quality education to everyone at a low price. The same idea came back with the radio where you can read, you know, the unprivileged school becomes the privileged one because you can have the best teachers for everyone. And then the TV. Uh, and then machines that uh, were sort of precursors of uh, this kind of personalized learning systems where you had this sort of pre-computers that showed you, you know, sort of a slide and asked you questions and all of that from the 1950s. And, you know, uh, B.F. Skinner, famous uh, psychologist, had, you know, those machines, those machines you just saw here, they will cure what's wrong with American education. And then when computers came, he was even more excited because he thought, we have, we have this machine that can, you know, instead of having teachers there teaching all this stuff, we can have these machines that can be infinitely patient and, you know, ask you questions as many times as you need and repeat the content. And there was a huge, uh, you know, a large amount of uh, products to, to realize this vision that they look like computers, but they were actually more like a sort of a, you know, glorified TV that would show you videos or images and, you know, things that were a little bit more like a computer or even ways to teach you how to drive a motorcycle using these kinds of systems that show you an instruction and then you have to make the right move or answer the question in the right way and all of that. So, you know, all of those things, all of those systems of uh, automa automating education, uh, 
delivering education, the same education to everybody at the same time, they started to become a bit more personalized, in quotes, because people said, okay, like computers, they, they don't have to show the same thing, but we can, we can make it personalized by allowing people to go faster or slower and all of that. However, the, the content that people were getting was still the same. So when people call those system kind of systems personalized learning or, uh, you know, it's a little bit like you're in a prison cell and you can walk around the cell at your own pace. So it's not really that personalized. It's just like everybody's getting the same. You can go a little bit fa faster, a little bit slower. But anyways, this was the second formula to achieve educational equity inspired by technology, which was let's come up with machines that can deliver content, deliver education. And what happened with all of those, uh, mo for the most part, is that they failed. So this is the famous project called School of One, which was supposed to be a, a computer-based systems to deliver personalized learning to kids at low cost and everything. Uh, it was implemented in New York City with lots of money and investment, and it failed. Then there was another big company called Amplify that kind of took this idea again and built these tablets with content and videos and tests and, and kind of textbooks and said, okay, now we're going to do this you know, through technology. And it also failed, uh, as you can see. Then we went to kind of MOOCs and online courses. And, you know, and even though uh, they they have some interesting applications, but they've kind of failed to revolutionize higher education as the original promise was. And then, you know, even a huge, enormous companies like Facebook um, try to invest in those systems of personalized learning or computer-based learning. For example, uh, Facebook uh, designed this thing called the Summit Learning Platform and partnered with uh, a network of schools in the, in the California called Summit and put their best engineers to design a system that would uh, present people content uh, in a personalized way and make you know, teachers work uh, easier. So, and what happened to the Summit Learning platform is that it also failed. And parents started to kind of, you know, reject the system and ask the districts to, to kick Facebook uh, out of the system and, you know, many, many different places in the U.S. So, this second formula for achieving educational equity that I'm talking about is based uh, especially with the help of new technologies based on this idea that uh, I'm going to read. And this is from Larry Berger, which is the CEO of Amplify, which is a big personalized learning company. So he says, you start with a map of what kids to learn. Then you assemble a vast library of learning objects, videos, tests, texts, and PDFs, all kinds of things. And you ask an algorithm to sort through and find the optimal learning object for each kid at a particular moment. Then you make each kid use the learning object and you measure them. You measure if they learned what they were supposed to learn. You move them to the next place in the map. If they didn't learn it, you try something simpler. So you have this map with these learning objects and you're constantly testing kids and moving them forward or backwards. And then he says, if the map, the assessments, the library were used by millions of kids, then the algorithms would get smarter and smarter and make better, more personalized choices about which um, things to put in front of kids. So that's kind of the blueprint, the, ma the, the, the main idea of a lot of those systems that I showed you that has, have been uh, perfected for like 50 years. But then... Larry Berger, uh, and this is an interview, that he, a talk that he gave, he, he continues. He says, here is the problem. The map doesn't exist, the measurement is impossible, and we have collectively built only 5% of this library of learning objects. And just because an algorithm, when the, when, uh, the algorithms want a kid to learn the next thing, doesn't mean the kid really wants to learn the next thing. And then, you know, you can read this quote, but it's a very interesting uh, talk because it talks about how the CEO of a company that designs all those kinds of technologies designed to replace teachers, how he is basically saying, you know, we're not there yet, we're not even close, we have 5% of the 
content that would make this possible and all of that. So I'm showing this because I go to a lot of countries and then people say, you know, um, sometimes uh, people from the government, sometimes people from companies, found, they say, oh, we are building a personalized learning system with all the best videos to teach kids all kinds of things. And, you know, in a couple of years, we'll have this complete map of everything people need to learn, a video and a test, and, and, and then we'll have this algorithm and artificial intelligence powering this whole thing, and it will be amazing. And then I said, well, no. It's not going to work, so forget it. Don't waste your money on this uh, on this kind of thing. And you know, and where where to put your money then? Where to put your uh, your efforts? Is there a third way? And I think the third way is to me very clear. Is it's all about not teaching technologies, not technologies to replace teachers to make education kind of more boring by, you know, making it you interacting with a computer on your own. Uh, but it's about exploration technologies. Technologies that allow you to create stuff, to create movies, to create robots, to create uh, art, to create all kinds of stuff. Because, um, you know, an educator that I like a lot, uh, Paulo Freire, says that creation is our ontological vocation. So, you know, that means it's sort of wh why we came to the world, is to create. I mean, uh, if, you know, when you create anything, when you are cooking something, when you're writing a poem, when you're creating a painting, when you're creating a robot, that feeling that comes when you finish that creation, that's something that's almost like unexplainable. And that's because it's this ontological vocation. It's like it's almost like we are realizing our human potential every time we create something. So why not do that in schools? And that's what you know John Dewey talks about, and Seymour Papert, and Paulo Freire. And that's what I think the big, as we uh, say in the U.S., bang for the buck is. So the big value of investment in educational technologies. But you know it's really hard to do. It's hard to do because. Teaching the same stuff to everybody at the same time is, you know, it's not easy, but it's easier than allowing people to create, to build, to do their own kind of projects and realize their own ideas and everything. But, you know, on a more optimistic note, uh, I think in the last 10 or 15 years, there are lots of good news about uh, making this, these kinds of technologies feasible and scalable. And so what, what happened? in the last 15 years. So the first thing that happened was that a lot of the, the things I'm talking about, people creating their own stuff, they learning things they care about, uh, constructivist kind of education, those things got sort of renamed or rebranded as 21st century skills. So, you know, if you talk to a minister of education or a secretary of education, say, oh, we want you to do constructivist education, they say, what? No, this is crazy stuff. This is like, uh, stuff for, for you crazy educators. I, I, I don't want to do that. But if you say, we're going to do 21st century skills, then everybody's like, yeah, sure, you know, every official in the government will be, yes, we want to do that. But 21st century skills, nothing, it's nothing more than a rebranding of constructivist education, which is about critical thinking, which is about building our own understandings of things and all of that. So that's great because, you know, it's sort of a trick. Now they want to do constructivist education and they don't even know they're doing it. So there is huge social acceptance of these kinds of values of progressive education. The second thing is that people started realizing that one thing that's very important is motivation. So uh, this is a, uh, comes from a paper by uh, two uh, uh, US researchers and they looked at data from thousands of kids in the US, um, kind of longitudinal data. And people used to believe that the best predictors for career choice in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, mathematics, were course taken in high school and, and your performance and your grades. So let's say if you got A's or if you got good grades in math and science, you're most likely to go to a career in math and science, right? Does that sound right? What do you think? Yeah. Do you think that's the best predictor for a career in science is if you get good grades in science? Well, it turns out it's not. 
turns out the best one is your interest and future relevance of science when you're in eighth grade. So if you go to an eighth grader, at least in the US, and you ask them, are you interested in science? Do you see science as something interesting for your future? Do you see yourself as a scientist? And if they say yes, even if they have bad grades, that's a better predictor than their grades. So people started realizing that interest is really important, motivation, engagement. So if you get, you, you might get, and you know, that happened to, to me when I was in high school, I had lots of friends who were getting A's in science and math, and they hated it with a passion because they were just doing it as a sort of, you know, a game, like, okay, I study, I get good grades, but the more I study, the more I hate it. And uh, I guess you can relate to that maybe in, in some of those disciplines. So engagement and, and motivation is really important. We need to get kids to like those kinds of disciplines. It's not just about performance. It's not just about tests. The second thing that people realized is that, you know, the stuff that we're teaching is pretty old. So this is, you can see, it's excerpts from a textbook, a math textbook. Of course, it's, you can realize it's old because of the font. But this is, you know, you can see the algorithms for multiplication, the multiplication table, and, you know, how you add numbers and, and all, all, all those kinds of things. And so, so this was being taught to kids in a school. And, and can you guess when? Uh, so in 1478, this is the first textbook in mathematics in kind of modern Europe from Treviso in Italy. And so, you know, people are like, oh my God, like we're teaching the same mathematics for 500 years. So it's not even about just the method of teaching, it's the actual content, it's, it's just too old. We can do all of this on our phones. Why are we spending the same amount of hours teaching this stuff now as we were teaching, you know, 50 years ago or even maybe 500 years ago? So, you know, by realizing this, people start, okay, we need to do something different. So, some countries are doing something different, and I hope Poland will be one of those. So, in Canada, for example, in British Columbia, they created a whole new mandatory course in the, in the national curriculum called Applied Design Skills and Technology. So, what is this for? It's to create prototypes, create inventions, learn about design, learn about engineering, invent, create, and, and all of that. So that's a mandatory thing in Canada, in British Columbia. Same thing happened in the US, the Next Generation Science Standards, which is the kind of national curricula for science. Uh, it says, students are expected to be able to define problems, generate multiple solutions, build and test prototypes, and optimize solutions. And they say, no, those practices have not been included in science standards until now but now we want those practices of engineering in mandatory science classes uh, in the US. So, you know, it's, it's becoming part of national documents and I would highly recommend for that to happen in, in Poland too. So, this is all talking about how progressive education, how all of those things about making, building and all of that, that's becoming part of national policy in many countries. The other thing is, that the cost that enable those technologies is much, much less than what it used to be. Like a robotics kit used to cost 5,000 euros in, I don't know, 20 years ago. Now you can buy a robotics kit for 30, a kit for 30 euros. Uh, it's cheaper than a book almost. And the same for 3D printers, the same for laser cutters, the same for all kinds of things. So, by the way, like, am I speaking too fast or just because of the translation? Is it okay? Yeah? Okay, great. So, um, we also have better tools. So, you know, when I was growing up, I was, there were like computers in my school, but they would crash all the time. The software would crash all the time. It wouldn't work and everything. Now we have much better tools. We have like Scratch, which is a very popular, robust, well-designed software for learning programming. We have uh, other kinds of tools and they work really well and so it's easier to use in schools, easier than 15 years ago. We have better and more research so we know more about how to do it and the mind share of that and the PR, the, you know, the kind of advertising on the public around those ideas is, is much more. So the maker movement is something very famous. Coding in schools is very famous. We just had the letter from the minister talking about how coding is in every grade in Poland. So it's something people 
are talking about much more. It's not just like crazy ideas anymore. Well, anyways, so that's all great. So this, this whole piece of the talk was talking about what changed, what's new in the last 15 years, right? So all of those things. But what is, what is happening in maker education now, which is a part of that? Uh, so what's happening in maker education now? Lots of schools have maker spaces. Uh, there is a maker space a fab lab here at Copernicus, and lots of schools, I guess, in Poland and many places have maker spaces, maker programs. They do all kinds of interesting things. But there are two big, huge problems with a lot of the maker programs that I know of and that I, we research, and that's you know what we call elitization in two dimensions. First, you have full-fledged programs, so programs where kids have tons of time to create, where they have good mentors, where they have good materials in affluent private schools, and very kind of trivial programs in public schools. So the rich kids, they get hours and hours with the best materials, they can go to competitions, they can be creative, create all kinds of things, and the kids in public schools get half an hour every three weeks with a tiny little kit and they make a light blink. Both people say, oh, I'm doing maker stuff, but the quality is just not, not the same. So elitization is one of the dimensions. And the second dimension is trivialization. So, you know, inventing and creating, it's, it's a complex, demanding uh, task. But if you want to scale it up and kind of massify it too quickly, often people do uh, say, okay, we need like this 30-minute maker workshop, otherwise we can't do it to hundreds of kids. So they do this very simple workshops, very scripted activities, so people are not inventing anything, they're just following steps, like in a cookbook. And what I call the keychain syndrome, like people go to a makerspace, they make a keychain, they go the next time, they make another keychain, and they just keep doing the same kinds of things, but without complexity, without depth and, and all of that. So those are two big problems in maker education that I want to talk about now. One is elitization, so this phenomenon of giving the real maker, the high quality maker education to the rich affluent children and a very simplified version to the, the less affluent schools. And trivialization, which is making it very simple, so simple that it's almost not worth doing. So what are the three frontiers to uh, overcome that, that, that situation? What are the three frontiers for equity in maker education? So one is integrating it into the classroom. I mean, it's important when you're starting to do it after school, but at some point you have to start going into the classroom, into the curriculum. Otherwise, as uh, Robert was saying, you have all this self-selection. So only kids who are already good at it do it, and the other kids don't do it. So just some examples of how to integrate it into the classroom. So in this school in California, we had a science teacher who uh, used to have their, the, the kids go to the science lab and the, every child had 30 seconds you know, to look at a microscope and draw something and every two weeks they would go to the lab and have this one minute whatever of time in a microscope. And then the science teacher pair team up with the maker teacher and say, why don't I, we build, you know, we let kids build their own microscope. So they build this kit with very low cost lenses and then they gave one to each kid, they assembled these microscopes and then they started doing science projects with their own microscopes that they kind of decorated and made, made very pretty and all of that. And so instead of the microscope be, being a 30 second experience in a science lab every two weeks, they had a microscope in their backpacks. They could take it everywhere, do all kinds of interesting investigations, take pictures with their phones or tablets, and bring to the school, to the science teacher, to discuss and to say, okay, what is this uh, about? How can we uh, you know, uh, design an experiment and, and all of that? So that's one way of integrating it into the classroom, is like allowing kids to build their own science instruments, for example. A second thing is by changing how you teach a particular lesson plan. So there was this lesson plan in a school, uh, also in California, about the Renaissance in, in Italy. And though they would learn about Leonardo da Vinci and Florence and all that stuff, 
and it was sort of a lecture, right? So imagine how boring it is to, you know, being lectured about the Renaissance without actually doing anything. So this teacher said, okay, let's, instead of listening about, hearing about Leonardo da Vinci, let's be Leonardo da Vinci. So she paired with the maker teacher in the school and got the kids to build the Leonardo da Vinci machines as a way of learning about the Renaissance and learning about Leonardo's, you know, engineering genius. Um, and then in this other school in Brazil, in a very poor area in Brazil, um, the teacher used to teach this unit on the nervous system for like 10 years as a lecture. So go to the board, the nervous system works like this, and he would draw like a neuron and, this, you know, and the brain and whatever. And then, again, he paired with a maker teacher in the school, and they got this uh, low-cost robotics board that's called the Gogo board, and then they told, okay, each child will design a neuron. So with a sensor, like an input, and some kind of processing and an output. So what they're doing there is they're designing their own neurons, their, their own kind of neural structures using this low-cost kit. And you can see what I like about this picture is that the textbook, it, it's used as a sort of a, a, a protection for the table, right? They're not even looking at the. But, you know, just to show that it's, it was a normal classroom. It was a normal classroom, and they were doing all this uh, stuff. And the teacher said, you know, he has never seen the kids this excited and all of that. Um, but, you know, a, a school that have, has very limited resources. Uh, it's not a school in a fancy neighborhood and uh, nothing like that. And this is another example of a robot theater. So this was an um, English teacher that was kind of a bit bored about teaching kids to write, how to write in the same old way. So uh, he paired with the maker teacher and the art teacher. And then the task was for kids to write stories in English um, and then make this kind of robot theater uh, uh, based on the stories. So they they wrote a story, they had this coding lesson, and they wrote programs for the robots to enact the story. And then they, they did the, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, props and sets and costumes in the art class, and then they had the robots enact their own story. <clears throat> and then there is something we developed in my lab called bifocal modeling, where you kind of, we kind of merge uh, science inquiry and maker um, activities. So, uh, the idea is that you design a sort of a science experiment on the computer, so you can see this kind of roller coaster experiment where you let a, a sphere kind of go down and then it does like this and you measure the time. So it, you're looking at like gravity and things like that. So you build a virtual model and a physical model using all kinds of maker tools. And then you have to compare both and see if they're different, if they're the same. The same thing with chemistry, you can do bifocal models where you do an experiment in the beaker, as you can see there, with the, for diffusion, and then you do it on the computer as well, and then you compare and, and contrast. And then we build also a version of that that's uh, called the, the lab in a cloud, which is remote. So you can do experiments uh, in a school, even in a school without a lab. So this, for example, here, the student is controlling a microscope that's sitting at Stanford from their school and controlling the direction of those kind of unicellular or, uh, uh, organisms and how they're swimming. So the microscope is at Stanford and the kid is in a school without a lab and then they can do all these kinds of things. And, oops, and then they can do uh, you know, very interesting experiments kind of comparing different, different hypotheses, different models. So here, you know, in, in the in the blue, here a student is comparing two different models, so two different explanations for this phenomenon of the swimming particles. In the blue one, uh, so the, the gray stuff is the, the data from the actual microscope, then the blue uh, area is the results from the first model, from the first explanation that the, the child came up with, and then he said, okay, this is not a very good, so let's try another kind of explanation. So the system automatically overlays data and uh, your own hypothesis. And then you can later do a kind of aggregate visualization where you compare your own versions of different explanations to see which one fits 
the data better, right? So that's, you know, another way of using those kinds of technologies to make science more engaging, more interesting, and to make kids work in, in, in more uh, sophisticated ways. So that's the first dimension, is making, um, making, making part of the classroom, so integrating into the, cl the, the classroom. The second one is making it real. So uh, let's take making to the real world. Let's do real projects that can impact your, your life. So this is in Thailand, in a school that, that's our partner, and the kids built their own segways. So they can kind of go to school and back, you know, in this kind of uh, re vehicles that are um, sort of made using recycled wheels and recycled batteries and all of that. So, you know, they built their own segways in the Maker Lab. This other school in the rural area in Thailand, the kids engaged in creating a, a, an irrigation system for the farm that would automatically find the best time for irrigation because sometimes you know, if it's too hot, it's not a good idea to water the plants because everything will evaporate. So they had the system with temperature sensors and all kinds of things that would automatically find the best way to, to water the plants. Uh, in this other school, this was, uh, you know, this is the janitor at the school. And he had to go every morning at 6 a.m., put his ear on this water pipe to see if there was water flowing, and if not, he would have to turn on the pump to fill the water reservoir in the, in the classroom and wait two hours, and then only after two hours, people would have water in the, in the school if this guy was sick or if he was late, there was no water in the bathrooms and all of that. And then the kids were like, well, you know, this is not a great situation. So they design a prototype of an automatic pump system that would just automatically detect when the water level is low and turn on the pump, and this was a prototype. But then they said, no, we don't want a prototype. We want the real thing. So they kind of hacked the pump system of the school uh, and actually did a real system that actually works with the water reservoir in the school. And here you can see um, the, the guy who looks a bit older than like 12 is my collaborator, Arnon Sipitakiat, who is a professor in, in Thailand who was leading this project. And another example is that sometimes kids have other ideas. It's not about science or math, but sometimes they are passionate about music. So this kid in Thailand uh, was very, uh, he didn't like school at all. He was always distracted. He was always kind of misbehaving and all of that. And he could never focus, never focus. Teachers are like, oh, this is kid is impossible. We can't deal with him. And then he went to the, 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 the maker lab or the, the fab lab at, that we built at the school. And he said, I want to build my own guitar because I'm very, I love music, I, you know, and I don't have my own guitar. So he got a guitar from someone else, uh, you know, like this. And he said, okay, I'm going to copy it. And then he started building a guitar and then, you know, he started dealing with all kinds of interesting things like the resonance and the, the, the length of the, the, the strings and, you know, all kinds of acoustic scientific problems and all of that. And then he basically couldn't, you couldn't take him out of the lab anymore because he was so interested, so focused on getting this guitar to work that the teachers were like, you know, I don't know what's going on, like, uh, we can't get this kid to go, go home, because he was so passionate about music, but there has never been a, a, a way for him to realize this passion in school. And that's where he, you know, the, the first time that he experienced being passionate and being, and, and he was not distracted by nature. You know, sometimes we give kids this, you know, uh, attention deficit disorder medication. It's just because they're terribly bored with what we offer. But this kid had no problem. He just needed something to be passionate about. So that's the second frontier, is making stuff real, making it interesting, making it relate to the real world and all of that. And the third one is research. So that's the last one. So uh, let me begin by talking about one project we did uh, where we looked at technological familiarity in many different countries, uh, three different countries, asking what kinds of technologies, uh, asking kids, uh, children, what kind of technologies you're familiar with. So, you know, we always say kids are digital natives, they, they can do all kinds of things uh, on the, their phones, whatever. Uh, when I was growing up, 
we used to say, oh, kids can program the VCR, you know, very easily. That was the technology that was current in, in my time. So, but these were, these were the results. Yes, it's true. Kids are digital natives. They can use phones, computers, tablets, everything very well. So 4.7 in that scale. But when we started asking about, okay, can you produce content? Uh, so videos and music and all of that, you know, it was not bad. It was 4.0, but lower. But when we asked, can you produce stuff that's not like media things, not like videos and music and stuff for YouTube? Can you make a robot? Can you program a computer and all of that? Then, you know, less than half of the students that were users of technology were creators of technology in that sense. I mean, it's a lot easier to create media products because we have a phone and a phone is basically a video editing machine. But a phone is not a, a, a good tool for programming. A, a phone is not a good tool to create a 3D printed uh, object. It's not a good tool for creating a robot and all of that. So those tools, they are you know, uh, not in kids' pockets and they are very important tools and they have to be in schools because otherwise uh, we cannot democratize those kinds of tools. Because uh, we, you know, we democratized in a way media creation because everyone has a phone, but we have not democratized coding. We have not, have not democratized uh, robotics, uh, physical computing, and all of that. So that's one reason why we need those labs in schools. The second study I want to talk about is this one. So uh, what we did here was to compare two groups of kids. One group first had a lecture and then did exploration. The second group did the opposite. First, they did the exploration, and then they did the lecture, right? So, I mean, I'm sort of giving it away, but which group do you think performed better at the post-test? The group that had a lecture first or the group that explored first? You know, this was a, 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 con a content uh, topic in biology. So what, what do you think? I mean, maybe you can read the graph and you might be able to tell. Yeah. So the kids who explored first, even if they had no, con no knowledge about the, the topic, they performed 25% higher than the kids who had a, a lecture first. Right? So that's what I'm saying. So letting students explore things before they get a lecture, in this case, in this, you know, in the I'm not talking that this is valuable, it is the same for every topic, every, but in these studies, and we did four replications of these studies, letting students explore increase their performance in 25%. So instead of giving them the content and then say, oh, now you have half an hour to play in the lab just to see, you know, do something fun, that's not a great, that's not great pedagogy. It's much better to give them an exploration activity, let them struggle and you know, be a bit frustrated even, and then you give the content, because then they have all the questions in their heads, right? So this was one of the studies that were, were, was kind of influential because people realized, okay, this thing about having maker labs is not just like for fun. It really in increases people's performance in, in, in you know, uh, different traditional school topics. Uh, Third study I want to talk about is about collaborative learning. And then there'll be one more. So uh, what we're, we're interested here is, you know, also in this issue of equity, because if you have kids working in groups in a makerspace, often you see that, um, you know, kids who already know stuff, they take over, they do everything, and the other ones are just watching. So we did a study about this where we had pairs of students working together and uh, so doing a, a given task. And then we used some special technologies to determine who was the driver and who was the passenger, right? So the driver is the kid who takes over <coughs> the computer and the kits and everything. And the passenger is the one that en ends up being more like an observer, right? And kind of helping out, but not really being the driver of the activity. And then we also split this group into <coughs> the group that was, um, the kind of high performer, uh, kind of higher grades, and the lower grades, right? Anyway, so uh, when we had um, two high performance kids, so two kids with high average, high uh, grade point average, uh, you know, two students that were having good grades working together, 
they learn a lot in, this, in, this, in the post-test. So in, the learning gain was very high, as you can see, almost 10 points. When two students were, that had low grades were working, working together, they, their learns, uh, the gains were much lower, about you know, five and a half. When we mixed uh, kids of high, high grades and low grades in, the same, in, in one group, and they were working together, if the driver was the kid with high grades, they learned almost as little as the group that had two kind of low-performing kids uh, together, right? Is it clear, more or less, what I'm, yeah? And then, when, when, you, ha when you switch, so when you let the, the driver be the low-performing kid and the passenger being the high-performing kid, which is kind of counterintuitive, because often we say, you know, the best kids should be doing, should be leading things. Uh, they learn almost as much as two high-performing kids. And you might, you know, be thinking, so why is that? How, what's the miracle? Um, so, I mean, the idea is that letting the less experienced students drive the hands-on activity almost double their learning. So why? Because when you have the least experienced student driving, you generate dialogue because he will, he's going to ask the other one, and the other one is going to tell him or her. So on-topic dialogue is one of the best predictors of learning, as we know from research. If the, the, the high-experienced kid is driving, there's no dialogue because he or she, they're doing uh, everything. When we inverted this, then there was a lot of dialogue. People were talking about it, and then they were learning much more. Uh, so that's the kind of thing that, you know, I talk about this because I try to explain that research is really important because without research, we would never know this. And without knowing this, we could never train teachers to design classrooms in this way. So we would be missing a huge learning opportunity because we would never know that this is you know, the optimal way to organize a classroom, especially a project-based classroom. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about in terms of studies is something we call multimodal learning analytics. So we realized that just doing pre and post tests and, and paper based things, it just wasn't enough to assess what was happening in those, in those um, classrooms and those maker spaces. So we started using something we call, you know, uh, multimodal learning analy analytics, which are techniques that can uh, detect all kinds of, you know, interesting things. For example, eye tracking. So here you have uh, two students wearing mobile eye trackers, and then we can do all very interesting studies on the quality of their collaboration. So, you know, the little dots is where they are looking at, their gaze. When the dots get red, it means that they are looking at the same place. So we can then do studies on quality of collaboration because if they're never looking at the same place, it means they're not really collaborating very well. If they're looking more at the same place, you know, it's better collaboration. But this is, uh, you know, very new techniques, uh, very new in education, but it allows us to look at, you know, what people are doing in those environments in a very, very interesting way. Uh, and we also designed th those kinds of object tracking systems where, you know, we give kids a task, for example, build a circuit, and then the system tracks every single action they do. So we know when they are adding things, we know when they're removing things, we know when they are trying an experiment. So, you know, we'll see that they will kind of remove something and we can, you know, the system can log all of those actions. And then we can see if they're getting better, if they're, you know, experimenting more, if they're getting more systematic and, and all kinds of things like that. We also design systems to uh, monitor what's going on in a makerspace so we can draw this kind of sort of heat maps and there's maps of, you know, who goes where. For example, who is, is there a, a kid or a student who is the ambassador of good ideas, someone who is going around teaching people other things? Are there groups that are working better, working uh, in, 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 in a worse way? Um, which machines are get used the most and all of that. So we can do all kinds of very interesting studies about the dynamics of those spaces that are very different than classrooms. And just as an example of that, this is a, a study that we did with gesture tracking. So you see those two girls are building uh, gear systems and we're using a, a gesture detection system uh, that you see zoomed in. Uh, so we can tell if they're moving 
I know both arms, one arm, if they're moving more or less, and, and, and stuff like that. So um, you see soon it will kind of merge back into the, the picture. Uh, of course, you know, it sometimes the legs look weird, but it's just because they're underneath the table. But so, um, so then we did this same kind of study with uh, 24 students, uh, novices and experts, two groups, and then you can see, you know, we're doing all this, this kind of gesture tracking system and all of that. So what we realized was that, yes, as predicted, kids who are more active, who are moving more, they learn more, right? And they perform better in the post-test. Kids who are learning, moving less, are less active, they learn less. Okay, there's nothing new there. But the really interesting thing was that when we compared experts and novices, we realized that the best predictor for learning was not the activity level, but was how many times do you alternate between action, active and passive, right? So the best predictor for learning was how many times a student alternate between doing and thinking. And we interpret, you know, being stopped moving as you're thinking about what happened. So the experts, they paused three times as much as the novices. So they would do something and then stop and kind of look at and decide the next step. The novices, they were just doing stuff all the time without ever stopping to think about it. So again, this is a great thing to um, teach teachers in a makerspace because they can observe kids and if kids never stop to reflect and to think about what they're doing, that's probably not a good sign. So you can help kids uh, monitor their own process of building things and teach them how to, every now and then you have to stop and reflect about what you're doing and think about what you're doing because that's how experts build things. They don't just do it by trial and error all the time, right? So uh, I try to show you three things that I think are important in maker education. One is uh, integrating it into the curriculum. It's, I know that in many places it's hard to do it in the beginning. So in the beginning, you have to do after-school programs, you have to do you know, places like museums, and then that generates excitement, generates interest, but at some point, you have to start going to the, the classroom, the real classroom, the science classes, the math classes, and all of that. The second thing I showed you is how to make maker education go into the world and, and make it relevant and make it interesting for kids by doing real projects, not just toy projects. And the third part is, how research is important to optimize and design those spaces so that you know, we actually know what we're doing because teachers also need to know the best ways to, to run those kinds of spaces and you know, we as researchers, we should be helping them uh, optimize what they do and do it in the best possible way. So all of that was just going back uh, because there are those two things that are sort of, sort of spontaneous things that happen in a lot of educational uh, uh, reforms, which is, you know, we find out something that's really very interesting and very cool to do with kids, and, but we soon realize it's kind of hard to do, you know, it's expensive. So this process of elitization, so we say, yeah, this is cool, but, you know, for the public school kids, we'll do a simple version of that and then let people who have money and resources, you know, get the full, uh, the full treatment. So that, that's not what we want. At the same time, when something is hard, there is this kind of tendency of just kind of making it simple and more, you know, trivial, and, and that's also not good because, you know, that's not what we want. So the reason I, I want to, you know, call your attention to, to that is that in many countries that I visit, and, you know, sometimes they are, uh, many years into this implementation of maker education things, and sometimes it's kind of too late for them to come back. They are already very, there's a lot of elitization, a lot of trivialization, sometimes baked in national programs. It's kind of too late for them. So, you know, I don't want it to be too late for, for Poland to have programs that are already uh, designed in a way that, you know, do not address those two things. And I, I want to say that, you know, there's a lot of stake here. Um, because we don't want to live in a world where uh, some kids will have this kind of education and some other kids will have uh, this kind of education. So we don't want to live in a world where if you have money, 
you can uh, you know, do projects, you can go to a makerspace and realize your passions, your intellectual uh, idea, your, your ideas and all of that. And some other kids are bored to death in schools going through this kind of computer-based systems or you know, attending lectures and all of that. Uh, because you know, there is a fundamental equity thing here. We might be sort of giving the same content, but we're giving it in such a different way that we're not really achieving equity. Because if you deliver the same content in a terribly boring way, people are not going to learn. And if you do it in a very exciting way, people will learn. So in a way, we're kind of reproducing uh, social and educational inequalities uh, in that way. So I think we have a, a once in a generation opportunity to do something very unique, which is to bring educational equity without uniformity. So it's, it's very exciting that now we can bring educational equity without assuming that every child is the same and everybody should learn the exact same things, everybody should have the exact same interests. Because we know children are different. Teenagers are different, young people are different, just like we are all different, right? But in school, we kind of have this illusion that we can treat people as just this uniform mass of people and teach exactly the same things, and they will somehow kind of adapt to that. Actually, they don't adapt. They just kind of ignore school because people are different, and we like to be treated differently. So, you know, the future, I think, is all about finding your own passions and educational and intellectual pursuits and less about being like everybody else. I mean, that's what we like as adults, right? We don't all like to be treated as a number, to be kind of, ma you know, consume mass-produced stuff that's all the same. We as adults, we like to be respected as people. We like to be uh, respected as people with, you know, different ideas and, and all of that. And, and why not, why deny this to kids in the name of what? of you know, uh, saying, oh, we, we just can't do it, it's too hard, or we don't have time, or we don't have resources. Uh, I mean, those people in schools, they will be the adults, obviously, of the future. They will be running you know, countries and companies and, and all of that. And imagine the potential of, instead of educating them in the very same way for 10 years, and then say, oh, now that you graduated, now you can think outside of the box. Now you can be creative. Now you can invent a new Google or Apple or whatever. I mean, they won't because they spend 10 years in school learning how not to do it. So how can we expect them to do it? So I think the future is all about finding that, your own passions, uh, your own intellectual pursuits, your own ideas, and not about uniformity. And, and I think the important thing is that if school does not serve that purpose, it will lose its purpose and we'll live in a world where school is less and re less relevant and, and that's a, f a future I, I, I don't want to be in. Thank you very much. <laughs>